Happy Sunday. Mazel tov. I don't even know what Mazel tov means. I just thought it sounded cool. Um, so I just woke up about an hour and change ago. I got my coffee. I have no makeup. I have no makeup like that kids, um, that kids quote or scene. I have no legs. Man, for anybody who's never watched kids before, I highly recommend it. It's pretty fucking disturbing, but it's a good movie. Um, <clears throat> good documentary. I mean, movie. Um, yeah, so today I've got ice cream, so ice cream cake and star puppy. Sorry, Huckleberry needed me to stop and give him kisses. I cannot say no to that cute little face. Um, so I've got ice cream cake in um, my Nemo bowl. And um, I brought my head change. This is members only strain. Um, and this, of course, is my, um, how do you call this again? dab pen that's right it's my dab pen I, f I find it very very remarkably easy to use all right i'm gonna take a, a little sip now I stuck with <coughs> ice cream cake today is because it's indica leaning, it's a light strain, it's, it tends to be a lighthearted strain. I really need it right now. I'm still carrying some anxiety from this past several weeks, especially um, Friday when my, um, my own attorney um, canceled our retainer for no reason, for no reason, just, you know, because I asked prudent questions. Um, I, on my retainer, when I first started this uh, journey with her, if you want to call it a journey, I'll call it the Baton Death March, more like, um, I, I made it very clear in my initial paperwork when I reached out to her that I believed my spouse had a secret life and I wanted to know if he had any aliases and I wanted to know if he had any um, secret families that he was funneling five grand to ten grand a month vis-a-vis um, -vis his checking his credit card um yeah it's in, it's on paper and um i asked her to confirm in writing uh, a couple days ago if my spouse had an undisclosed elite meal force background or three-letter agency background um stop lay down i so i reached out to her to ask that and with a quickness with a quickness she didn't even address the question. She just said, yep, this is over with a quickness. Um, that's not news. I That was one of my conditions when I reached out to her. I want to know if this guy has a secret life. I He's so good at what he's done to me. I think I'm not the only one. I mean, you can't be that good on the first try. I think I'm not the only one he's done this to. In fact, his brother, his brother built his ex-wife out of... Um, 34,000 euros. I found that out when I reached out to my former sister-in-law back in February. And um, I said, hey, this is what Daniel told me about your divorce. My spouse told me they were getting divorced because she wanted to have another baby and his brother didn't. Um, she was like, oh God, no, that's not at all it. She said that her, her ex-husband, my former brother-in-law, um, had built her out of 34,000 euro. This was a single mother a single mother she had a new infant when she met marcus um and that's my brother-in-law my former brother-in-law and that's what they did to her and like me she was also vulnerable she struggles with um she has a mental health um condition and um depression and i struggle i have ptsd and so we both made very easy targets for this family very very easy targets um it's uh very very sad that my my own attorney would not take me seriously i i sent so many screenshots of actual crimes being committed him threatening me 
him attempting another wellness check, um, him, it, some of the stuff he was posting online was really like sketch. And um, yeah, even told my attorney that he had posted and monetized um, non-consensual adult content that I made for him over the years of our long distance relationship. Um, so yeah, my attorney refused to take my report of a good faith um, allegation of a crime and my attorney refused to allow me to report to her um, knowledge that my foreign national spouse had um, complete unfettered access to my phones during a time while I had an active TSSCI clearance and while I was working a live combat line in support of the MQ-9 Reaper. That was on February 7th when I tried to tell my attorney and she, she became very belligerent with me when I tried to tell her she spoke over me. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, I'm part of the MQ-9 Reaper community, the very teeny tiny MQ-9 Reaper community, the same MQ-9 Reaper community with a very disproportionate number of whistleblowers who end up missing, dead, accidented, um, accidented. Um, it's Madeline Tomey and her father. Um, and then people who end up in prison. And then there's me. I, my... They discredited me through my mental health history um, with PTSD. Um, but it's just, yeah, I, I totally trailed off there. I was, I was gonna go somewhere. Wait, where was I gonna go? There was something I wanted to pull up. Uh, it'll come back to me. Um, yeah, my medicine's working. That's a good sign. That's a good sign that I'm a little, a little forgetful now. It means, you know, I can kind of um, decompress from that, that anxiety and stress. Man, I really wish I, I could remember what I was about to look up. Um, just, oh yeah, and, and my attorney, I found this out like three days ago, my attorney claims to have um, expertise in military divorces. Yeah, uh, having spent nearly 23 years in the military as an enlisted force peon and much of that as a frontline supervisor or raider, um, that would have been my one of, that would have been my first or second question. Have you talked to your attorney about your security clearance? My own attorney told me not to tell her. She refused to accept the report on audio. It's absolutely disturbing. <clears throat> absolutely disturbing. Um, anyway, I'll shut up about that. Uh, so yeah, this, this seems to be working pretty well. I'm, I'm a fan. I'm liking it. So, um, let's see what the weather's going to be like today. I didn't go out yesterday. I stayed home all day yesterday. I was totally like in a homebody vibe. I didn't want to go anywhere. I didn't want to do anything. Um, it's not that I'm a doer. I'm not a mover and a shaker necessarily. I just like to be outside and get fresh air. I just, yeah, I just wanted to be in my own little cocoon and not in a bad way. I was just feeling it. I just wanted to be snuggled up with Huckleberry and just living our best life from home. Oh, oh, you know what I do have to say? Holy shit. So for Matt Walsh, not watching this from home, which is a good thing because he's doing good work. Um, I owe this man an apology. I was wrong. I was really fucking wrong. Um, I, you know what? I made a split second judgment. It was really unfair. I don't, I don't agree with the way he handled it on Twitter. Um, publicly, I, I don't agree with that. However, comma, my criticism couldn't be 
more off base if I'd intentionally tried to make it more off base. So I need to own that. Um, it, it wasn't intentional. I, I just got the wrong impression from the guy. And within like the first five seconds of his documentary, I just completely tuned him out because of that split second impression. Um, not fair. So I did finally, with an open mind and an open heart, I pulled up the documentary yesterday. It was exceptional, absolutely exceptional. The thing that I really appreciated about Matt Walsh's style is that he is able to ask open-ended, critically developed questions and he remains calm and placid. Um, I mean, but I don't, I also don't want to change who I am either. That is part of who I am, being a little bit of a hothead. Um, so we all need a hot-headed friend. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to take a sip really fast. But anyway, anyway, yeah, I was way fucking off base. Um, had his movie opened with the scene in the Loudoun, Loudoun School District. Had his documentary open with that scene with him speaking passionately and calling these people out to their faces unabashedly, unabashedly calling them out. I wouldn't have been able to jump off the movie, the documentary. Um, but that doesn't, that's not me saying that I don't like, I didn't appreciate the flow. The flow of the documentary made complete sense. I was just, you know, I made a split second judgment. It was unfair and, um, yeah, he could have handled the whole, you know, fix this please a little better. Yet, as I continued watching that documentary, it became more and more evident why he was so, um, what's the word? Uh, 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 uh. I don't want to say selfish, why he was so vocal. I, I, I regret his wording in some of that, but in hindsight, I get why he was so vocal. Because when you see Matt Walsh in that scene from the, the school district board meeting and how impassioned he is, that comes from a deep place. You just don't pick that up and walk with it. That came from a deep place. And so I, wow. That really hit me in the feels. That really made me think, wow, you've got both feet in your fucking mouth, girl, and you're not very good at yoga, so you should probably sign up for a couple classes and pull them motherfuckers out your mouth. But then the thing with yoga is I'd become so limber that I could easily slip them back into my mouth. It's a it's a loose lose. Um, yeah. Exceptional documentary. Um, I'm glad. Although I don't agree with how he did it, I'm glad that he was very, very vocal and treated it as an urgency in hindsight, even though in my previous episodes I said it was not emergent. Oh no, no, everything about this message is an urgent message. It's an emergent message. This is a fucking sick fucking pandemic that he's talking about. Um, there were many times where I was absolutely appalled by the content. Um, Matt Walsh was speaking with a psychiatrist. I don't recall her name, um, but very ethical woman, very willing to have the unpopular opinion and be unapologetic about it. I fucking love people with backbones. Um, she pulled out this book that had been circulating, I believe she said, among 10 year olds, and I believe, now bear in mind, I might have, don't get too fixed on the detail of what I'm about to say next. I believe it was in class in school to discuss um, sexual, and I call it sexually exploitative ideology. That's exactly what it is. Um, and when she opened the book to those illustrations, I wanted to vomit. I wanted to vomit. That was nothing, nothing like the talk that my mother gave me when I was six years old. Um, my mo in fact, my mother did have a book too, and it was very appropriate to a six-year-old, very appropriate. Um, 
didn't show any naked pictures of mommy and daddy procreating. No, it showed illustrations of mommy in maternity clothes, saying things like, would you like to feel the baby kick? Very appropriate for a six-year-old and even more appropriate that it came from my mother. When I saw that book, I wanted to vomit. When I saw those illustrations, I was absolutely horrified and saddened that any 10 year old came across that. It was absolutely horrifying. Um, I did, and I, you know what? I'm gonna eat crow again. I was wrong about this guy's writing. I, I got to hear an excerpt of his book as he read it to small children. It was delightful. It was delightful. Um, the kids laughed and it was easy to see why they were laughing and giggling because it lets them know it's help, that book is helping them develop at a young age the critical thinking skills to look for absurdities like that. Because it is absurd. It, it is absurd. Um, and, and people setting these hair splitting precedences, I, some of it I think is unintentional. They, I think some people really do believe that, but they, they create these hair splitting precedences without realizing that, you know, hello, Irving Goffman, anybody? That other people will look to that and say, well, I can split that hair even further. You want to tempt me? Psht. So, um, yeah. I, I thought it was a deeply necessary, um, necessary point to make um, and to kick the, the, the horse over. And I thought Matt Walsh's book is a deeply appropriate response to the sexually exploitative ideology. Deeply appropriate response. And because I've ambassadored it so much, I'm going to buy it. Um, I believe in that book. Um, um, doesn't mean, you know, doesn't mean I'm gonna, I'm necessarily part of Matt Walsh's followership, but yes, I was wrong about that documentary, and I spoke of him very unfairly. I will own it for people not watching this from home. Let me have, let me tell you how easy it is to apologize. People think it's hard to apologize. It is not. Apologizing if you can hold yourself like um, personally accountable, apologizing is really relatively fucking easy. Yeah, it's the pride it's the pride hurdle that people have to get over. Um, but we we've been taught that apologizing is a sign of weakness, and apologizing being apologetic can even have legal consequences which is really fucking perverse. That is so fucking perverse. Um, not being apologetic, but like as an apologetic to a cause, but being apologetic in the sense of, um, I'm sorry, mea culpa, please forgive me. Um, of course, you know, there should be legal consequences for some stuff. Like they're saying, I'm sorry, mea culpa, please forgive me for child abuse. Yeah. Yeah, obviously there should be legal consequences, but I'm talking about like, I'm sorry I door dinged you. I mean, and then we watch these people on <clears throat> on mainstream media in the entertainment industrial complex, when even when they've been confronted with irrefutable proof of their, and I'm not going to say lie, but their mistake, bad decision, um, they double down and start gaslighting. It's like, just apologize. Nobody's expecting you to be perfect. I mean, I hope not. I'm not. I mean, I guess I kind of do to other people when I get, when I'm not being mindful um, and, you know, living up to my highest self. Sure, I think we all do that. But, um, the, oh man. The, I, I, this movie is an excellent movie. I'm glad that they got it to air on the first day of Pride Month. I will, let me talk about Pride Month. And I'll, I know I kind of trailed off there. I, oh, apologies, yeah. So the reason why apologies are so easy for me now, they, they were never particularly hard because if I know 
if I know I'm in the wrong, I might for a couple, several hours, try to find a way to get myself out of being in the wrong by making a compelling argument, but it'll still stick. If I know I'm in the wrong, I can't lie to myself otherwise. I will feel it in my gut and I'll feel it in my heart. So like, I have to apologize. But of course, you know, it's, it's scary admitting that you're wrong. You know, it's like, basically admitting to yourself, not so much to others, but admitting to yourself, you don't have control, sometimes even over yourself, let alone other life circumstances. Um, so, yeah, but I'll tell you what's made apologizing a hell of a lot easier. Hard is being in a correctional setting. And I call, I call my three, my last, my, my, Involuntary admission back in 2020 was a facility that was extremely beautiful. The staff was very professional. Um, it was a very therapeutic environment, but um, my three involuntary hospitalizations as a result of blowing the whistle, um, very correctional, extraordinarily correctional-like. Might, it might as well have been gel. That's exactly what it was. Um, so, yeah, compared to that, getting online or doing not a podcast episode to apologize, that's not a big deal. I'm, I'm very sorry to Matt Walsh not watching this from home, and I'm very sorry um, for denigrating your work. I am absolutely grateful that you um, took the time, energy, and um, just courage, abject courage, to get this message out there. And thank you for standing up to the Loughton School Board. Every every word you said to them was true. And I, I'm so grateful to hear somebody saying what they mean and meaning what they say. Yeah, those people are monsters, Matt Walsh. You're right, they're depraved. Anybody who would share that content with a child is depraved, is a monster, is grooming. No 10 year old should see that shit. That is disgusting. That I am, I might not be a parent, but here's an argument I will make. I am somebody who cares about my fellow mankind, me being part of it, my fellow man, uh, be that man, woman, child, um, and I am somebody who believes in the Republican virtues of a direct democracy. Yeah, I want to I want to leave behind, I want to contribute to a legacy by paying taxes, by being informed, by being uh, politically adept, politically proficient, so I don't get misled by politicians like we, they've been doing for decades. They've been dumbing us down in the politics sector and um, fleecing us for decades. Um, it, it's, it, it's no mistake that the prince is like seminal to political theory. To this day. Th th that's no mistake. Yeah. Um, but, oh no, I totally brain dumped. It'll come back to me. Yeah, as a as a taxpayer, especially as somebody who served in the military. And I don't want to say somebody who served because we all serve, right? As somebody who served in the military. There are people who serve in the engineering sector. There are people who serve in the institution of medicine. There are people who serve in politics. And there are people who serve themselves in all those institutions, too. So, yeah, especially having served in the military, it's, it's very important to me that children, even though they are not my children, can have a healthfully functioning, optimally functioning, functioning public education system that is enriching, illuminating, um, fair. It, people talk about us winning both world war, both world wars. I'm sorry, if you go to Central Europe and Western Europe, no, no. Their public schools are 
beautiful. I would have killed to study in an environment like that or to learn in an environment like that. Beautiful. Oh my God. I swear to God, we did not win those wars. What we won was a ticket to um, help men. I don't know if anybody knows the history of the um, re-engineering of Paris, but Hauptmann was, um, I'm fucking up the pronunciation, of course, was a major well-known architect. And yeah, yeah, that's basically what we did when we sent the Army Corps of Engineers to uh, modernize Germany. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Hey, let's, let's blow up Dresden. Nobody will ever know. Let's keep the rest of Germany nice and pretty and intact. Shit. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's exceptionally important that I contribute with taxes, with knowledge, um, with civic moral responsibility, like an orientation towards that, so that... This generation of children and hopefully infinite generations of children to come will have an enriching public school environment in which to be educated, enlightened, informed. Yeah, isn't that exciting? And that makes me excited. So I don't, I don't, I don't take any shade when people say, "Oh, if you're a parent, you need to watch it." I don't. Yeah, I don't think that's shady or anything. I just think that's like parents saying, "Hey, oh my God, oh you gotta watch this." Yeah, I, but I will challenge people who are not parents, who parents of children, if, if that, I don't, yeah, whatever. I, I'm going to challenge people who are not parents, who do not have my orientation towards public education. I'm going to challenge you to improve upon that, just like I've had to improve upon that over the years. Um, it is vital to leave behind a an optimally functioning public education system. It's absolutely vital. Um, let me grab my... Otherwise, otherwise, we're just going to keep paying taxes for upper middle class families um, so they can get subsidies to send their kids to insanely expensive private schools. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Um... So going back to Matt Walsh's documentary, I cannot stress it enough. Please watch this documentary if you care about children, if you care about <clears throat> <clears throat> if you care about um, halting the forward march into another wave of ethnic cleansing in this country. That's exactly what it is. Not only is it sexually exploitative ideology to groom children, um, and to um, gaslight Mandela effect society into thinking, oh, it's always been like this. It's all, it's okay. It's okay. In the Middle Ages, kings and queens um, let their ten year old daughters get married and start reading right away. It's okay. Do you, no, in the Middle Ages, uh, in the Renaissance, <laughs> in Regency era England. Um, yeah, that was not peculiar to the common folk. That was peculiar to the elite class. That depravity has always been there. Um, anyway, anyway, um, where was I going with this? I was going somewhere with it. Um, yeah, so definitely watch this documentary. Um, it's absolutely imperative that we protect children even if we don't have children ourselves it is absolutely imperative that we protect children because children don't know what they're deciding children don't have a say they don't know they don't need this confusing um exploitative grooming ideology in their faces at that age or stage in their lives they don't what they need are boundaries. That's exactly what they need. I, um, our 
remember the first time I attended a Stark briefing. I forget what they called the first iteration of it. It would have been about 2005 when I was assigned to USAFE at Geilenkirchen. And that's the NATO air base in the Benelux region, Belgium, Netherlands, Lex Luxembourg region of Europe. And um, I'll never forget the briefer showed us this disturbing video and the language they used was just inappropriate. Like I was not a school child. I did not need to know, like I could, yeah. Um, and after she halted the video, it was a, basically the video is a vignette, a short little vignette of, um, of a young airman, a woman, young woman, um, who left her drink unattended at a party, somebody spiked it, and, or she let, she let somebody buy her a drink that she didn't know, and they spiked it, and then they assaulted or raped her later on. It's obviously been almost 20 years since I've seen this little vignette, so please bear with me on the details. Um, well, at the end of the vignette, the airman, the, the actress portraying the airman was like, Oh, he raped me and then he was inside of me. She was telling this to the chaplain. Um, anyway, the briefer, a woman, this is a woman. I don't remember her name, but I, uh, she was a GS um, employee on Geilenkirchen and um, she paused the, she paused the briefing and she said, okay, what would, what would you guys have done in this situation? Well, the vignette started out with the girl with her friends. She was with her girlfriends. They showed up at a bar or something, a nightclub. She was with her friends, her girlfriends um, that she came with. And then a wolf separated for her from the herd is what happened. Um, and when she asked that question, what would you have done differently in this scenario? I raised my hand. And I was not trying to be, I'm not a precocious person. I'm a late fucking bloomer. I have no common sense. Common sense is not something that comes easily, easily to me. I tend to live up in the clouds. So yeah, I have to challenge myself to be pragmatic. But I raise my hand because this is something my mother taught me from a very young age. Um, Sarah Thompson, go ahead. I said, I would have told my friend do not leave your drink unattended because somebody could spike it with the drug. So don't let somebody buy you a drink. Don't leave it unattended. And she said, no, that's not the right answer. I wasn't saying it from a perspective of victim blaming or victim shaming. No, I was, I was giving, I was giving profoundly practical advice that, you know, I'm not saying people are going to be able to prevent being raped or assaulted. No, not at all. There are sick people out there. There are very sick people out there who don't think twice to violate human beings, who don't think twice to violate a young woman who's out with her friends for a night of fun. No 21, no 19 year old woman, even if she was underage drinking at that bar. I, yeah, we all did it in the military. Um, no 19 year old woman needs that it's so when i when i shared and, and victim shaming wasn't really a phrase back then at least not in the military maybe it was circulating in the civilian sector but in the enlisted force structure it was not a shame a, a phrase necessarily um i i didn't really start hearing that bandied about until probably like 2010 ish thereabouts In the military, I, again, civilian sector, different story. I can't speak to that. Um, I don't have a skill set in the civilian sector. Barely have a skill set in the military, according to DOD. Um, so, yeah, when I raised my hand and said, I would have told my friend, don't leave your drink unattended and um, don't let somebody buy you a drink. And, and she said, no, that's the wrong answer. No, it's not. That's the right answer. That's, that's the answer my mother gave me. My mother was not a stupid woman. My mother told me when I was 13 or 14, I, if you drink or if you're out with your friends, like 
like out in the playground, don't accept drinks from, you don't take candy from strangers, right? Why would you take a drink from a stranger? Um, so it was from that perspective that I shared that um, unusually, uh, unusual for me anyway, pragmatic advice. Um, and to be told that's the wrong answer, no, it's not. Absolutely, that it's not the wrong, that's like your first line of defense. That's your first fucking line of defense. Yeah, what a shame. That I that woman was a high-ranking GS level. And, and she wasn't saying it to be mean. What she was doing is she was following the course curriculum as she was instructed. And she wasn't following the course curriculum as instructed because she was a malignant person. No, she thought she was doing her job. Yeah. And, um... And she wasn't nasty about it. I was just like, I just knew in my heart, she's wrong. That's that's not right. I and I, I said, I said, I didn't. I wasn't nasty nasty back to her. I said, no. I I would have said something. I would have said something to my friend, and I have, and I, I have many many times. And um. So and it, shit. When my baby sister was, um, she went to boarding school. My piece of shit stepfather and my mama, um. PCS for civilians not watching this from home, permanent change of station in active duty. That's what they call it, PCS. It's basically a move, a mandatory move. Yeah, it sucks. And um, so they PCS from Mountain Home, Idaho to Fair RAF, Royal Air Force Base in Fairford in the Cotswolds. And my baby sister ended up going to a DOD boarding school called High Wickham. And I remember her telling me that she and her friends would sneak beers in the dorm. And, it, you know, I mean, it was they weren't, like, drinking, like, a keg. It was, like, they had a can of beer and they shared it with, like, five girls. Not ideal. And I said to her, I said, well, and plus they were in England, too. Stand by. I said to her, you know, um, she was 14 at the time and she was, she was a very buttoned up kid. I mean, she was, she had her head on straight, good student, um, grew up with three older sisters. So she wasn't exactly what I would call naive despite being buttoned up. Um, yeah, she, she kept her head on straight, but I, I told her even, I said, just, you know, Ashlyn, just remember, um, Make sure you keep an eye on your drink at all times, even if it's a friend, you just never know. And um, and it was a one and done conversation. And she, she got the gist and she already knew. She already knew. I, it was just a refresher. Like, just, you know, just remember. Da, 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 da. So, um, yeah. Uh, Again, going back to the briefing in GK, that's what we call Geilenkirchen, um, going back to that briefing, I, which means horny church, by the way, I just think that's fucking hysterical. Um, I don't think that the briefer was grooming people. No, no, it was not like that. I, again, she was just doing her job. Um, yeah. And not, not deviating from the curriculum. And she might have, she might have honestly believed that. And I can't remember the answer she gave. What was the appropriate, what, what would have been the right thing to do in that situation? Um, I think she said the right thing to do was to follow your friend. Um, but that doesn't teach your friend anything. Following your friend doesn't teach your friend anything. It just teaches your friend that they can always count on you. So the moment you go to the bathroom, um or go get in line to order another drink. Yeah, that doesn't teach your friend anything by following them around. Um, following them around just, um, just gives them a completely stocked pond, a pond full of wonderful fish to eat and nothing to catch those fish with.
so um don't no following around so going back going back to um matt walsh's what is a woman absolutely imperative i i know i already brought it up once for non-parents out there please educate yourselves I'm going to be sharing this on my Facebook, even though I anticipate some of my friends will be uncomfortable with it. I, I don't care. I don't care. And, and, and it's not that I want them to be uncomfortable, but I also, I care more about keeping children safe than I care about making adults uncomfortable, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, always going to pick children over adults being uncomfortable, period. Um, except for when they want sex changes, yeah. I guess, yeah, whoops, I guess that quote didn't age well. Didn't It didn't even age well long enough to be a quote, fuck. So anyway, um, yeah, please, please, please watch um, What is a Woman? Um, please take this content seriously. If you're of a different frame of mind, but you're starting to get this kind of sense of dissonance, like something's not adding up here, um, consider watching this movie. I, actually, I think I think this movie is this would be a great movie for people who are starting to develop that dissonance. You know, because there was a time when I I t I was like, oh, okay, you know, if they want to be call themselves a boy or a girl, I didn't actively think about the sex change process, but I I if I had I I would have obviously gone with yeah they a child cannot consent to that i'm fairly certain i would have um uh having worked in pediatrics for a couple of years active duty so um outpatient setting just admin i wasn't anything fancy um just like the person that gets yelled at at the front desk it do be like that in a clinic sometimes um Definitely, definitely watch this movie. Absolutely imperative. Absolutely imperative. It's, um, it, it, I trailed off, but it's a great movie for people in that, it's actually a pretty big demographic, which is why I'm kind of frustrated with a lot of elected officials right now. There is a, there's a large demographic that is continuing to grow of people who are like, uh, what is going on here? I don't know what to think. I voted for this guy and he says good things and, you know, he comes across like an affable guy, but what's going on here? Yeah, there's a lot of people like that. So get the, like, please put this move in your mouths. Um, Matt Walsh makes a lot of insightful points, not necessarily by pontificating, but by asking questions and, um, these some of the ex all of the experts with exception to a handful um and of course the maasai um villagers who were like what the fuck are you talking about dude you can't be a woman and have a dick like yeah that was their i'm just repeating what they said for people not watching this from home you're like that is transphobic no i'm just repeating i'm paraphrasing from a documentary it doesn't matter how i feel about it I'm just paraphrasing um so it's uh yeah please watch this movie especially if you're starting to feel alienated about what's going on in our country um like I started feeling alienated about it was I I felt alienated from politics well before the whistleblowing thing um, a certain branch of pop, a certain group. I felt alienated from the GOP way, way long ago. Um, yeah, I, this movie is great for people like me who aren't as informed, who do, we don't like if I don't have a child, so I don't go to school board meetings. Although maybe I have been to one, maybe I should start going to school board meetings. That's my tax money. I want to make sure parents are getting um uh fair play yeah maybe i should maybe i should start going to school board meetings i don't know i don't know it's um it would be a responsible thing to do um hmm. i'll think about it 
Uh, but yeah, for those of us who aren't parents, we we might not get all the information, all the current events that you guys get from the scuttlebutt at school board meetings, from information, from, um, you know, I, I don't have, I don't read any Facebook pages. I don't follow any Facebook pages for school school districts so i don't know if there's like a scandal going on or if there's a crime or a human right let's call it for what it is human rights violation that's what it is a human rights violation going on in your child's school um <clears throat> so for those of us without kids please 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 watch this movie um it, it keeping a republic keeping a democracy healthy is not just an obligation i don't know why i'm doing this of people with children. It's the obligation of every citizen of age to do that. Because um, it's, it's self-defeatist not to. It literally is self-defeatist. Um, so, yeah, great movie for people without kids too. Exceptional movie. Um, I, I need to start holding, because I feel so passionately about the topic, I need to start holding myself responsible for maybe getting out of my own lane because I focus very specifically on a little niche corner of this topic generally. So yeah, on that note, I owe Matt, um, what's his face, Matt Walsh an apology too. Like I, what I was like, uh, he's not including Fort Hood. Blah, blah, blah. Well, that's, that's not his niche perspective. His niche perspective is um, a father, conservative father of small children. Um, and um, whatever experiences he's had to um, make him so passionate about this cause, that's his niche perspective. So I was very unfair and hypocritical to do that. Yeah, I guess I'm human. Uh, Matt Walsh, not watching this from home, I'm gonna do a little peace pipe hit. I'm sorry, man. I am going to leave my episodes up. I do think <clears throat> people need to see that, that I, I'm a journalist and I feel like I do a damn good job. I don't need a fucking Pulitzer. I don't need a fucking, um, seven figure paycheck. I know I do a great job at what I do. Um, cause I, I do it from the heart. Um, and it's a completely intrinsic motivation. I just want, I work for free, dumb. Um, so anyway, um, oh no, I, I totally trailed off. Oh God. Well, mm. yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave my episodes up because it's important for people to see that I make mistakes. We don't get that in mainstream media. And that's, that, that is absurd because if you think about the teams of people they have working on the set of those it's entertainment it's not news it's it's propagandized entertainment that's all it is propagandized entertainment um they they have teams of researchers and when i say teams of researchers the bigger the outlet um the more expert level the teams of research yeah they have teams of researchers who research and compile their reports for them. They have a producer or rather a team of producers in their ear. Don't say that. Oh, you better say this really fast. Oh, wait, hold up. Go back. Oh, duh. nope. Can't say that. The sponsor can't say that. Sponsor, sponsor. I don't have that. I watch these back and I'm like, oh Jesus, I totally fucking gaffed. Oh Jesus. I, um, I, that was, I didn't mean to say it like that. That's misleading, not intentionally, but that could be misleading and I wanna hold myself accountable. So I think it's important for me to leave those episodes up so people know it is okay, one, to make mistakes. It's even more okay to fucking own those mistakes and apologize to the person you transgressed and to do it from the heart, to do it like you mean it, because you mean it. Like if you're not ready to apologize, don't apologize. 
feel that apology first. Feel that contriteness in your heart before you open your mouth. Because then and only then does the apology come from the heart. If you're not contrite, it's not an apology. It doesn't matter what you say. If you don't feel that contriteness in your heart, like, fuck, I fucked up bad. Um, I did something bad. Not intentionally. I didn't, I didn't intend to misjudge or mislabel or denigrate Matt Walsh as a human being. I didn't intend to. It wasn't like I was, well, I mean, I, mean, I was doing it in the moment, yes. But it's not like I intended to have a bad impression of him. You know, that was my bad. I did a knee jerk. I fucked up. That, that foot went in the mouth and I let it hang out there in, for a couple of days. Um, so people need to see that I fuck up. Just like we need to start seeing mainstream media fucking up. Because they do. They fuck up a lot. They fuck up a lot. Um, and they don't own it. And I, I mean, it's important to own your fuck ups because then and only then can people learn to trust you. It's not a sign of weakness. If somebody watched us and was like, oh my God, she was so wrong about that. It's human nature, yeah, because I do it too. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I'm also human. So I, I, think, I think owning our mistakes authentically in a way that honors all parties is um very not just appropriate it's integral it's integral it's why we don't have peace in this world it's one it's one factor why we don't have peace in this world um so yeah um i gotta take some coffee it do be like that oh wow it's not even 12 yet yeah so i've i've no hardship of owning my mistakes and um leaving those episodes up there so people can be like, wow, she really, she was way off base with this guy. Um, and then seeing the metamorphosis of me coming to that conclusion for myself, fuck, I was way off base with this guy. I'm so glad I gave Matt Walsh's documentary a try. A few days ago, I was like, fuck it. I'm not, I'm not watching this shit. I'll just, I'll grab the cliff notes online. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I am also hot headed too. That's I usually I I'm not a grudgy type of person. I'm I usually, you know, have my little kick and scream for a day or two, and then yeah. Um. Anyway. Anyway. Yeah. I'm so glad I was wrong. I'm so glad I was wrong, and um, very glad to apologize for it. Um. And also, I'm gonna keep that those episodes up because if let's just hypothetically hypothetically, and I think this is something a guy like Matt Walsh, a person like Matt Walsh could appreciate not watching from home, thankfully, because he's doing amazing things in this world to keep kiddos safe, and I fucking love that. That's awesome. I can always support that fucking cause. You better believe it. I, 20 fucking three years in the military. Isn't that what we serve for in the military? To keep kids safe? Um, anyway, um, Oh, I, I think Matt Walsh not watching from home could appreciate had I hypothetically, and I wasn't, I was dead wrong, had I hypothetically been correct on my um, split second judgment impression of Matt Walsh, I dare say those are appropriate questions to ask. So in that spirit too, I'm also going to leave that up because people need to even though I was wrong. When you watch that, know that I'm wrong. Know that I'm completely wrong. Let's get in the hot tub time machine and be like, okay, I already watched the one episode where she realized she made a complete jackass of herself and denigrated this guy very fucking unfairly. Um, yeah, so when you're watching it, know that I am owning I'm completely wrong, but I, I need people to hear the questions that I'm asking. And I, like, don't know the man. It would be a pleasure to meet him. He's busy, not going to worry about it. Um, I, I, I would think somebody of his caliber would be happy that people are asking those types of questions, would want people asking those types of questions. So in that spirit, I'm going to leave those questions up. But I'm completely wrong in my perspective. Um, completely wrong. Uh, so let me go to, let's see what, let's see what um, is going on at Twitter. Ding, ding, dong. 
Um, end wokeness. Oh my god. Black power. I saw this earlier. This is fucking hysterical. Fucking love it. Yeah, I'm, I'm over wokeness, but you know what I'm also over? I'm also over rhinos hiding behind wokeness. Like, Ron DeSantis, I don't want to hear end woke mind virus anymore. That's not a political process. It's not even political terminology. It, it sounds cool the first couple times, but th that should not be your platform, dude. Your platform should be, hey, I was in the military, and it tears, terrifies me that um, junior ranking enlisted force peons are sitting in prison or ending up dead or ending up suicided or ending up missing. Um, yeah, that should be part of his platform. If he's going to sit there and be like, I was in the military. I was such a good guy then he needs to incorporate that in his platform. So less about the woke mind virus, Ron. Stop, stop, stop fleecing these people. Tell them how. How are you going to fix it? How are you going to use your expert level proficiency of the profession of arms to fix the abomination that is going on in our country? That's what we need to hear, Ron DeSantis. Not the woke mind virus. Not pronouns. You're not fighting pronouns. I want to hear about Tellhook. I want to hear about Tellhook Association. I want to hear about naming ceremonies and where you stand on naming ceremonies, Ron DeSantis. You know what a naming ceremony is and you know how depraved they are. Hashtag Tellhook Association. Telhook Association donated to Ron DeSantis' campaign. Z. Z. He was a, a congressman before he was governor of Florida, I believe, 6th District, in my former district, um, where his buddy that he endorsed, Mike Waltz, the Green Beret, married to um, Mossad player Julia Nishiawit. That's a good faith allegation, Julia. Hand to God. Um, yeah, Julia Nishiawa, according to many sources, profoundly reliable sources, have told me that Julia Nishiawa is a Mossad player. And has been. And knows exactly what 9-11 was about. Her family does too. She knows exactly why certain inter interpreters have been targeted for persecution. Her family has benefited greatly from that persecution. Julian Ashiawit and her family owe this country answers. They do. Julian Ashiawit will be behind bars. I, I will see to it, Julia. I will. Yep. In a country where you guys are throwing junior ranking enlisted personnel behind bars for what is required of them by their chain of command, and Congress, and oftentimes International Law and Geneva Convention, and they don't have a pot to piss in. And that's why you do it, because the officers do have a pot to piss in. It's called Stephen Carpenter, attorney at law. Let me tell you about the perversion of simultaneously being a staff judge advocate or a JAG, and then also doing military law on the outside. It's a perversion, Stephen Carpenter. It is an absolute perversion. Disgusting. Totally rinky, same thing. I'm looking at you, Allison Weber. As an Air Force Reserve JAG officer, you should never have taken my case. Period, and you did. Stephen Carpenter should never have taken my case, and he did. Disgusting. Disgusting. That's what these people do to enlisted force peons who blow the whistle. And they clean our clocks. I'd like to know where Ron DeSantis stands on the USS George Washington. <clears throat> A lot of enlisted force personnel have come up dead on that boat. Dead and suicided. Yeah, they, ha they even had an expose several months ago. 
It was a one and done. It was a control the narrative. It was a PSYOP plant. The PSYOP plant broke the story to encourage other personnel on the USS George Washington to come forward. It was a trap. They entrapped those people to harm them. They came forward. They, they saw those <clears throat> headlines. They saw the articles and their spirits were buoyed. And they thought, oh my God, somebody knows about the situation on the USS George Washington and they're going to help us out. No. They exploited those junior ranking enlisted force personnel instead. Profoundly. Yeah, the people who broke that story, they're PSYOP plants. Disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. And Ron DeSantis has said nothing. Ron DeSantis, if you and Mike Waltz want to hide behind the heraldry and um, the shiny blingity bling of your military careers, why don't you open your mouths about the enlisted force structure? Why don't you open your mouths about Jack Teixeira, Airman Hell, reality winner, Captain Kevin Larson, who did not kill himself, he was assassinated. It was a CIA coordinated hit. Um, Director Burns knows about it. Chris Ray was read into it. <clears throat> that was a CIA coordinated assassination because Captain Kevin Larson blew the whistle on the human rights violations that <clears throat> were going on in the um, the MQ-9 Reaper combat drone community, the community to which I was assigned my last five years in the military. And when he wouldn't back down from his integrity, his chain of command colluded, according to many sources, to have him drugged. Many of those sources say that his girlfriend, a stripper that he'd recently met, was the one who drugged him. And then they had him, oh, oops, surprise piss test, you got a pee in a cup. Oh, you're positive. Oh my God, we're going to throw you in jail. We're going to throw you in federal prison wh where you're going to be terrorized for blowing the whistle in a stitches get snitches kind of way. Oh, he wouldn't have even lived to the trial. Yeah, he, they would have jacked to share at him. They would have jacked to share at Captain Kevin Larson. And he wouldn't have even lived to the trial. Um, so many E3 undergrounders said that he fled. He fled Las Vegas for his life. He was terrified. That's why he drove three or four states away. Instead of, you know, the Air Force says he's a druggie, why not just overdose? Because he wasn't a druggie. And he knew it. And he knew he had been drugged. He, he didn't know who. He didn't find out till the very end that his girlfriend was up to no good. Um, but he knew he'd been drugged. He knew he'd been set up. And that's why he kept fighting it. That's why he kept standing up to say, no, I'm going to fight this. And then at the tail end, his life was threatened. The same way in what I just mentioned, Jack Teixeira, if you think Jack Teixeira is sitting and um, having the typical inmate experience in detention, waiting for his unfair trial, thanks to mainstream media PSYOP plants and CIA and other intel operative types, um, you're sorely mistaken. Jack Teixeira will not get a free trial. We will be lucky if Jack Teixeira lives to see his trial. Yeah, they don't want him going to trial. Yeah. The judge, the judge who has investment portfolios with BlackRock and Vanguard, the judge does not want this going to trial. Nobody wants this going to trial. Nobody at the 102nd Intelligence Wing in Otis Air Base, um, Massachusetts wants this going to trial. Absolutely nobody wants this going to trial. So the word on the street from the E3 Underground, they are doing everything to break this guy down psychologically that they can. So they can either get him to 
plead guilty like they got Airman Hell to do um, by breaking Airman Hell down. Airman Hell, Airman Hell is a tough guy, but these people are very sophisticated. These people are sophisticated and everybody has a breaking point. Um, yeah, they, they want to break him down so he pleads guilty and doesn't name drop anybody else and they can, you know, put a uh, plug in the hole so the boat doesn't continue sinking. Um, and um, more ideally, they want to break him down psychologically so that he is compelled to take his own life. That's that's exactly what they want. They 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 don't want him opening his mouth at that trial and name dropping and saying what really happened because what really happened is Jack Teixeira reported a law of armed conflict violation to the New York Times after his chain of command reprised against him for standing behind his integrity for not for not disting, distancing himself from his core values, despite the the, the severe backlash against him. Um, yeah. Michael Sphere, when he received Jack Teixeira's um, LOAC, we call that a LOAC report, Law of Armed Conflict Violation Report. Um, when Michael Schwierz of the New York Times, a longtime CIA operative and double agent and a um, prodigy brainchild of Victoria Newland, um, when he got wind of it, he immediately knew who to contact. This man is not dumb. He, he we're talking about about two decades, give or take, of CIA experience. And they didn't, they didn't pick him up for the job because he was um, wet, green behind the ears either. Yeah. So um, Michael Schwierz is the one who reached back to DOD, to the U.S. intelligence community. And um, based on that LOAC violation report, he name dropped Jack Teixeira. And he colluded with Jack Teixeira's chain of command to... Um, to develop um, false charges. So what they did, they were able to do some cyber ops tweaking and make it seem like Jack Teixeira disclosed all this unauthorized uh, or all this classified information, which honestly, if you think about the president, he, the president's, um, how much classified information has he disclosed? Why is Congress not calling for his impeachment yet? Why are we just still hear hearing about this on mainstream media? Like you know, six, six months after the Twitter files broke, please Congress do something, do something. Stop getting on, on Fox, stop getting, and it's, this is on the Republicans. This is on the Republicans. I'm tired. I'm tired of the Republicans in the Senate. You guys are money grubbing pieces of shit. Most of you. Um, and I'm tired of the peop the Republicans in the House. I'm growing quickly disenfranchised, quickly, um, what's the word? Um, I'm quickly losing confidence in them because they're perfectly capable of getting up on Fox News and saying, yeah, what he did was bad. This is bad. This is bad. Oh my God. I don't want to hear your opinion, Josh Hawley. I don't want to hear the the paraphrasing of your fucking dissertation from Stanford. I'll use my fucking imagination about that connection. Stanford is a hotbed of CIA activity and breeding grounds and recruitment. Hotbed. Hot. Stanford prison experiment. CIA run experiment. Not making this up, y'all. So, um... I don't, I don't want to hear about, you know, any, anybody occupying an elected, uh, uh, an elected office. I don't want to hear your opinion. I'm sick of hearing your opinion. I'm sick of hearing the kumbaya. This is what it's going to look like. It, it, if you vote for me, which is kind of sick because, you know, you're still in office. 
you're still, many of these people are holding elected office as we speak. And they're like, this is what it's going to look like if you vote for me. Well, if Ron DeSantis was worth his salt, wouldn't Florida look like that? And I'm not, I'm not bashing Florida. I enjoyed living there. But there is, there, there is a homelessness issue in Florida. I'm not saying it's as bad as San Francisco's, but I am saying that became evidently clear to me when I was, I hadn't even closed, we hadn't even closed on our home um, outside of Orlando, but it became evident to me within hours of being at that hotel. Um, yeah, Orlando has a homelessness crisis. That's Central Florida. That's, you know, Ron's, that's Ron's um, uh, motherland, shall we say. I mean, he told his constituents the same thing when he ran for mm, co congressman of the 6th district, when he ran for governor, and now he's doing it, running for president. Um, yeah, let's look at Florida. Let's, let's look at Florida. Don't stop paying attention to the affluent enclaves in Florida talk about the homelessness many of those people are veterans F florida has a very high proportion of um of veterans retired and um or career veterans and veterans yeah obvi like how many of them want to retire in florida duh um yeah the homeless the homeless population in florida has a high percentage of veterans. Ron's a military leader. Why isn't Ron addressing that? Ron gave, this time last year, give or take, Ron gave $90 million to conserve manatees. To protect them. And you know, I'm all for conservation. I, I love conservation. I think it's great, but these manatees were doing just fine. They were doing just fine. Um, and besides, I'm paying the $90 million. I can't even afford to go check them out. Isn't that kind of fucked up? I have to pay for it. I have to pay for that funding and I can't even myself go check them out. That's fucked up. Like if I showed up at that conservation place, they probably, oh, well, it, it costs about 20 bucks to get in. I know, I already paid for this shit. I already paid for this shit with my taxes. I shouldn't have to pay more. So um, I would love to know where that $90 million came from. Word on the street, uh, manatees is a play on words for man at ease. Meaning, it's kind of like, um, what's the word? Um, not an idiom. It's, it's a play on words, but it's like invisible ink for the diplomat diplomat warrior aristocracy for the intelligentsia um non-intelligent or i mean non-military intelligentsia the literati the politically um the politically preferred um upper middle class to upper class constituents um manatees yeah just basically paying tax money so the DeSantis administration can funnel it back to donors. It's amazing, isn't it? Um, Ron DeSantis was able to raise $8 million in um, campaign finance contributions after Elon Musk, um, after they hosted a space forum. And... Uh, Why can't he be that effective while he's in office? He's still in office. Why can't you be that effective? This man is taking time away from his constituents to run for a different office. Does that not smack? Like, I get that it happens, but come on. Think think about the logic of that, though. Like, think about the law. Shouldn't there be, like, a break? Shouldn't he wait till he's no longer the governor? So, and I'm not saying he's break, broken a law. I'm just saying think about it. Think about how little sense this makes. It's just now occurring to me right now in this moment. Um, he's an elected official. He's the governor of Florida, and he wants to run for president. 
campaigning for president, campaigning for the Senate is a full-time job. You can't reasonably be giving your constituents your all your energy if you're campaigning for president. It, it just, it doesn't follow. It doesn't follow. The campaigning for president is, is too, too big a job, too heavy a job to do that. So we got a problem here and not just Ron DeSantis, other people, he's not the only one to do it. Oh no, we, I, I'm sure I could think of Democrats who do it. At this point, I'm just gonna call them Uniparty. Uh, yeah, it's shameless. It's absolutely shameless that we accept that first and foremost. I'm, I'm talking about myself too because it never occurred to me until now. Like, why do we accept that? He's basically saying, hey, I need time away from the office as governor to focus on my career, to focus on my career progression. It's disgusting. And it's disgusting that we let it happen. And it's disgusting that he's not the only one who does it. Ron DeSantis did not make up this strategy in his defense. Um, this is a strategy that we have, as American citizens, per permitted to abominate, to pervert our democracy. We need to own this one. Yeah, there's no reason why a governor of a state needs to be running for president of the United States. It's incompatible. You you can't be the fully dedicated to your current constituents if you're on the road and dedicating your energy to getting elected as president. I, and logically, think about it. Which one do you think he's going to... Um, to triage higher. Ron DeSantis has always wanted to be president. This is something he's felt ever since he was a little boy. Not so much felt that he wanted to work for it, but felt that he deserved it because his mother told him that. Um, so it's, I mean, I don't need to ask Ron DeSantis, wow, you're running for president and you're the governor. Um, which one do you feel is the greater of the two priorities, the more pressing or urgent of the two priorities? What do you think he's going to say? Oh, I, I think I dedicate all my time to being the governor of Florida. No, you can't. It doesn't make sense. He can say that, and he can say it like it makes sense, but if you think about it, if you unpack it, if you unpack the role of a governor... And the role of a, not even the role of president, but the role of campaigning for president of the United States, the highest elected office in the land. They're not compatible. They're not compatible. It's disgusting. Why do we accept this, people? Why, why do we let this sickness go on? Why aren't we lighting up our elected officials on both sides. This is not a Democrat thing. This is not a Republican thing. Why aren't we lighting up by our elected officials on both sides? They ask us for our money. They ask people for millions and millions of dollars. These people are so fucking awesome at fundraising and so fucking awesome at conserving their um, campaign contributions throughout the course of the campaign to maximize their their amplification effect to get elected they brain dump this the moment they get sworn into office and we do too why do we brain dump it Ron DeSantis just showed me his ass Ron DeSantis is patting himself on the back I raised eight million dollars um in less than 24 hours <clears throat> hint yeah Twitter made that possible. You're welcome, Elon Musk. No, I don't mean that in that way. I mean, you know, and he might, Ron, De Ron DeSantis is actually, even though he's phony as fuck, he, he would probably have said thank you um, for that in all, in all fairness. He probably would have made a tweet like, thank you, Elon Musk, for letting our blah, 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 blah. Um, but, um, where was I? Hmm. Hmm. 
You know what? Stand by. I'll remember. So Ron DeSantis showed his ass to me, and when Ron, DeShant Ron DeSantis showed his ass, he showed me the asses of all Uniparty players. Um, this guy was like, I just raised $8 million. I just raised $8 million. Um, yeah. So he's just showed me in less than 24 hours he can raise that kind of money. Why is this not showing up on his fucking resume? Why did I, a retired veteran with a bachelor's degree, and I don't mean that in a sense of superiority, but I, I, I tend probably to, towards a more slightly, um, maybe average, slightly above average in terms of being informed. Um, uh, why, as a veteran with several tens of thousands of dollars to my name, and an emergency credit card to my name with um, a $20,000 limit, why as a veteran did I get evicted from the Hilton Bonnet Resort because my spouse, my abusive spouse, who has an undisclosed special ops background according to a couple of sources, um, yeah, that my attorney did not disclose to me. My attorney knew. She did not disclose that to me. That's illegal, highly illegal. I didn't know he had a, I did not know that he had that background. If I had, I would have been required to report it on my SF-86 in some capacity. So it's very, very, very bad that my attorney did not divulge that to me. Um, uh, but anyway, Ron DeSantis raised $8 million and we've got veterans getting evicted out of hotels despite having the means to procure a hotel room for probably the rest of the year there. Not that I would. Um, it would be a very foolish way to spend money to stay in that be nice hotel. I, I enjoy it immensely. Um, but yeah, uh, I got evicted. And here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. That Hilton Resort, the day that I, the day before I got evicted, the night before, they hosted a gala for senior ranking military officials to raise money for veterans. I got evicted the following day from that hotel. Retired veteran. They knew I was a retired veteran when I got evicted from the, the, Hilton um, Bonnet Resort, what, Hilton Signia Hotel, that's what it is, Signia Hotel in Orlando. They knew that I was a veteran, a retired veteran. I got evicted. That's what Hilton thinks of veterans like me. I got evicted. Not only did I get evicted, um, my circumstances were profoundly extenuating, profoundly. Profoundly, it would have been nothing. It would have been nothing for Alicia Khan, the general manager, to have run my credit card like I told her to extend my reservation out for another two weeks and to immediately run the credit card before my spouse cut that credit card off. She did not. I got evicted. That's on Hilton. That is sick. That is absolutely sick. Why, why was it sick that I got evicted? Because... My spouse had threatened another wellness check on me on the, I believe the 19th of September when he found out I wanted to go through an attorney to divorce. He didn't, he just wanted to go get this quick and dirty divorce done with. And I was like, oh no, because yeah. at that point I knew he was involved in criminal type activities. I didn't have all the information. I didn't have all the dots to connect, but I knew like, uh-uh, no, no. This is a no-go. I'm absolutely going through an attorney. Um, and he didn't like that. He did not want people poking around in our business. I know why now, because he was hiding his professional background from me. I thought my spouse was a service engineer from, um, from Niehoff Index. No. No. Hmm. So that means 
this undisclosed background of his, I might be eligible for his pay and benefits. Yeah. It's insane. It's so insane. It's so insane. So anyway, um, yeah, Ron DeSantis weighs $8 million and Ron DeSantis is going to use that $8 million to tell you the same thing we've always heard from people who run for office. Shit, Ron DeSantis is so good at getting people to give him money and persuading people. He made $8 million while being the governor of Florida and the president or uh, running for president. Why not give some of that money back to your fucking constituents? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Oh my God, this guy, why, why, why do we even have a gridlock in politics if these people are so effective at persuading people to give them money? It's fucking ridiculous. We should not have a gridlock in politics. These people, these people show us their resumes and we don't even know it. We don't even pay attention to it. Oh my God. We need to start asking ourselves these questions. We need to start thinking critically about what these people say and do. I refuse to give money to any campaign that is not going to tell me at this point how they are going to fix something. I don't want to hear what. I don't want to hear why. I don't want your emotion porn. And that might sound mean, but I don't want your emotion porn. I, I'm not going to high tower RFK Jr. because of who his father and his uncle were. I I am I don't care about Alexandria Ocasio Cortez's um, emotion porn of a manufactured childhood story. Her family was very well connected. They fled Latin America after fucking carpet bagging their way through it for generations. Um. Her family's very well connected. They go back to Kurt Cortez. As in, yeah, that Cortez. You're not going to hear her say it. She's going to talk about her father. Why did we have a pot to piss in? Bitch, you all fucked up your own country and then you came here and tried to do the same thing because it was lucrative. Um, anyway, anyway. Uh, enough about that shit. Let's see. Let's see what else is going on on Twitter. Um... This is what occupation looks like. So true, not oppressed. I'm gonna tell y'all what, when I was stationed in Germany, that's when I got my first taste of gay bars. I was spoiled for life. So, it, and to be fair, they were smaller cities and, and, and larger towns. So it wasn't like Berlin in your face, but my very first gay bar was somewhere, it might've been in um, Maastricht in the Netherlands. Or it might have been in, blah, 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 blah. It, I think it was Maastricht. I'm, bless you, bless you, Ducky. It, guess what? It was a bar. Yeah. People weren't dressed in like leather straps, um, gyrating with garish makeup slapped on their face. Cross-dressing? This is nothing new. This is nothing new in history. It's just not the norm in the workaday life. We we find it absurd. This is not new. King James. King, yeah, that, that King James, the Bible dude. Yeah, that King James. Uh-huh, uh-huh, openly gay. But what they didn't know, they, they used to kill gay people back then. Uh, only gay people who got in their way. Yeah, um, King James was a prolific predator of young men and boys and children. Um, uh, what you doing, Ducky? It, it was, it, I mean, look, look at, look at Baroque Rococo style and the attire that men of means of that age dressed in. This is nothing new. This is nothing new. The elites have have had these behaviors institutionalized through the years. Um, and it's also nothing new that they're trying to inculcate these values into, into our culture 
So they can further gaslight us into thinking that that's not disgusting, depraved behavior. Yeah, that's also nothing new. Yeah. yeah look at look at 1830s in the Northeast. There was an influx of, imagine that, imagine that shortly after, uh, shortly after the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, imagine that a bunch of well-connected Brits just showed up in New England and um, upstate New York, one of them being the forebears of um, Joseph Smith's family. They said, oh, we're just, you know, here we are, here we are. And they built some fancy homes and they started something called the Spiritual Revolution or the Spiritual Revival. And basically, um, let everybody know, hey, the South is, an, is inherently bad because slavery. Newsflash. Newsflash, people not watching this from home. Some of those people own property in the South. They just got away with it because the property was in the South. The property meaning a human being was in the South. That's how they got away with it. It was nothing from a statesman, from a... It was nothing for an elected official before, during, and after. After. Yeah, you heard that. After the Emancipation Proclamation for them to own property in the South. It was absolutely nothing for them to do that. So you get this spiritual revival, sweeps across um, New York, the literati, Everybody want, oh, we need to become abolitionists. Well, people not watching this from home tend to anachronize the fuck out of what it meant to be an abolitionist in that day and age. People assume that to be an abolitionist in the 1830s meant that you were an integrationist as well, meant that you were somebody who believed in equal rights. That was seldom the case. Many abolitionists were ardent racists. They were just arguing for a change, um, a change in dynamic of the transactional system. That's what they were. These people were businessmen. These people were carpetbaggers. So um, South Bad, even though many of these northern statesmen owned property during the Civil War and after in the South. Um, uh, yeah, they, you know, the whole... A slave, a slave, uh, an enslaved person has three fifths rights or whatever. It's three fifths a person. Uh, the northern statesmen were not debating that and criticizing it out of the kindness of their hearts. They didn't. They didn't. Yeah, that's right. You heard that right. Northern statesmen didn't want slaves to be counted as citizens at all because in the South, and granted, I didn't agree with the construct. Um, wait, I might be fucking this up. Stand by for a second. Yeah, the, the, the North, the Northern statesmen, the Northern elected officials castigated, castigated that under the auspices of, oh no, they're humans. Under the eyes of God, those are human beings. They're just not equal to us, but they're human beings. That was their, temp this was not hidden. Their racism was not hidden. Their racism is palpable, it's in your face, it's overt. For people thinking that an abolitionist is the same as somebody who is, um, somebody who supports democracy in all aspects. Um, yeah, so, no, oh no, these people in the South are going to have more political power and political pull than we do. Oh no, this is a problem because there's X, Y, Z, many millions of enslaved people in the South. And so that's how much more voting power they're going to have um, with legislation, blah, 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 blah. Do you know what the Northern statesmen were particularly interested in with the South? This is something that escapes a lot of people. We hear about Charles Dickens, we hear about, you know, Dickensian England and what industrialization did to that. The just, it didn't just tear apart people. It, 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 it literally turned cities into cesspools. 
That's what it did. It turned cities into cesspools. Um, you you want to read about it yourself? Google Marx and Engels Reader. And Engels, I think his first name is Richard, his father was an industrialist. And um, they describe at length, at fucking length, in grave detail, some of the descriptions are fucking disgusting. They describe at length the impact that industrialization it had. Well, I say they, Engels, describes at length the impact that, um, that industrialization had on the environment. That this climate change argument is nothing new. This is they're just rehashing it. Um, uh, although it was warranted back then, um, Engels was calling out his father and um, people like his father. He he demonstrated that he was concerned about what was happening in I think it was Liverpool or Manchester that his father had a big factory. Um, so yeah, the cities in New England weren't far behind. You go to Philadelphia, they have something called they had something called Trinity Houses in Philadelphia. That's where they housed um, predominantly poor, almost unanim unanimously poor Irish families. Teeny tiny houses, teeny tiny like jail cells that they would put. You can Google pictures of this. In fact, I'm going to do it right now. It's obscene, and you can actually go for your, go down to Philadelphia and see them for yourself. I have. It's obscene that people used to live in these conditions, predominantly Irish people, before, during, and after the Civil War. Yeah. It's obscene, Ducky. Stop. Good boy. I'm going to look up Trinity Houses. People need to see this shit. So um, this is... Uh, this is to my uh, brothers and sisters who are black, especially ones who are not educated on Irish history. And I'm not super educated myself, I'm getting there. But y'all need to know that the Irish had y'all's back. It was the establishment that pitted us against each other. We had the exact same problem. We were being indentured out to America in droves and people here indentured service. Oh, wow, the, I'm sure the masters were completely ethical and legal about that. No, they weren't. They, the women who were indentured oftentimes got raped and assaulted um, or ended up pregnant by their masters and turned out onto the streets. That yeah, it was it was slavery. Um, history wants to water it down and call it indentured servitude. But when you're when you are recruiting young children whose families and parents and siblings are dying off in droves because of the great famine of 1849 if i remember correctly not the only not the first time that the british um royal houses engineered a famine against the irish oh god no far from it far from it the irish have been a thorn in the side of british colonial colonialism going back at least one millennium at least one millennium. Yeah, the British finally brought the Scottish to heel, and then they kept picking at the Irish, kept picking at the Irish, kept picking at the Irish, kept picking at the Irish. So, um, yeah, the great, the great um, famine of 1849 in Ireland wiped out, I want to say millions of people. And Ireland was not a very um, population-saturated country. Um, so Trinity Houses, this is disturbing. Trinity Houses, Philadelphia. And you don't see this in history books. You don't see this in um, liberal-leaning Marxist mainstream media. You don't. And there's a reason why you don't see this. They don't, they don't want people to know that Irish people suffered as badly as other people. Okay. All right, they're just, they're showing up the churched up images. Um, let me look again. Trinity. Philadelphia. Irish. Poor Irish. Okay, let's see if this will bring up pictures. Nah, it's, I wish I still had my, my, textbooks I don't because then I could whip it out and be like here are pictures there's, there's a reason why it's not coming up could be I just have the name wrong I don't I'm pretty sure it's Trinity Houses Trinity House 
poor Irish. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Nah, it's just... Uh... Uh, you know what? I might have the name wrong. It's been several years since I've thought about this. It's been since, like, 2013. Um, so I might even have the name wrong. But believe you me, when I say they lived in squalor, they lived in squalor. Let's just say the slave quarters on plantations look like mansions compared to to how and i'm not i'm not saying that neat that that makes them tolerable no no i'm just giving perspective if you've ever visited a plantation um and seen the slave quarters generally speaking it's a rough hewn log um with a sometimes an earthen floor sometimes a platform floor like a platform like a raised platform floor um Trinity houses, no. Trinity houses make slave quarters, the traditional plantation style slave quarters, I swear to God, look like fucking McMansions. It, that fucking depraved, that fucking sick. And imagine, imagine if your body's on top of bodies in there. Breeding ground for sexual assault. Yeah, breeding ground for rape. Uh, breeding ground for disease. The, the government did not like the Irish. The government wasn't not fond of the Irish. The Irish, the Irish having fled Ireland because of the British antagonizing them for well over millennia, um, did not think highly of participating in the government's wars. Yeah, because the people they wanted to send back to war, send to war back then. Yeah. Poor people. Oh, the Ulysses is... Poor people. Oh, the Ulysses is good! Poor people. Um, yeah. Uh, the Irish didn't want to fight in those wars. The Irish didn't want to be involved in the Civil War. The Irish didn't want anything to do, for the most part, the poor Irish didn't want anything to do with the revolution, necessarily. Um... They especially didn't like that other groups were permitted to sit out of the war. Um, they didn't think that was fair, that they were drafted, that they had to had to fight in these manufactured wars. So anyway, like, go, going back to the carpetbaggers in the North, the elected officials in the North looked at the South as prime fucking real estate because they'd carpetbagged their way through the Northeastern cities. Yeah industrialization they fucking they they decimate you want to talk about a climate issue these old money families like the vanderbilts uh no if 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 um cooper anderson cooper is still benefiting off that criminally acquired wealth windfall wealth he has no right to talk because the industrialization of his forebears whose wealth he is still benefiting benefiting from greatly, so much so that he almost controls a fair portion of mainstream media. It's a lot of fucking power to have um, for somebody who doesn't believe in what his grandfather did and um, how his grandfather benefited from it. It's a lot. They decimated the the environments of these cities and towns with industrialization and... Um, and that wasn't the only reason, of course, but the South, the South had all this untapped land. They, you know, the, the South was more agrarian. It was perhaps maybe more aristocratic leaning, whereas the North tended to be more mercantile leaning. Um, but yeah, the South was very agrarian. Um, they just, they saw, hey, cheap land. Wow. Um, the South had not been industrialized quite like the North. Um, and that likely had to do with the fact that in, in Southern states, um, because of geography, and also because of the way that um, the, the purpose for which most, the, the people who migrated to the Southern states, 
the purpose for which they migrated tended to be different than those who migrated to the more northeastern states. More northeastern, we're talking about people saying they're fleeing religious persecution, crayoses of their day and age. They were doing just fine. They had the means to flee. They were doing just fine. Um, so, um, so you had a lot of that more clustered in the north, the northeastern, the northern colonies. Now in the south, people tended to migrate to the south from Europe and the British Isles and other places too um, because of the opportunity there, the opportunity to own land. That's what indentured servitude um, promised poor Irish people, the opportunity to own land. Go through the south, go through the typical, um, typical trailer park in the south, that's a ghetto too. Um, that's not cultural appropriation. You'll fucking live. Um, go to the typical trailer park in the South. Ask people their last names. You're gonna you're gonna meet a lot of Scotch Irish sounding surnames. You're gonna encounter a lot of Scotch Irish sounding surnames. And generally speaking, people who tend to look like me, like yeah. That's not owning property. No. And then they wiped out generations, uh, a few generations of men in the South with the Civil War. And then the other wars, like the, the Spanish American, Mexican American, I always conflate the two and fuck up the names. Um, and then World War One. And hey, come on, we need bodies for World War Two, y'all. Oh, hey, <laughs> Vietnam, you guys haven't played in a while. Oh, forgot Korea. Um, no, nah, so the South tended to be quite agrarian, quite spread out, was relatively untapped in terms of industrialization. Did they have industrialized aspects in especially the major cities like Atlanta? Yeah, but because they were able to spread out more and they had more resources and land, free, it's cheaper land, the land was much cheaper in the South, um, yeah, they, they weren't, they hadn't fucked up necessarily their environments, their resources, quite like the North had. So North wants to, the, the statesmen from the North, the elected officials from the North, essentially wanted the South to, in, to capitalize off of it, to capitalize off of it. And they made no bones about it. They made absolutely no bones about it. And um, in order to do this, in order to sweeten the deal, they ended up pardoning, not just pardoning, but grandfathering in prominent, prominent military officials from the Confederate Army. Did, did the enlisted people get the same treatment? No, they were stuck in horrible um, POW camps. We don't, I don't think we use the term POW officially back then. Um, they were stuck in horrible POW camps where they oftentimes starved to death, froze to death. Um, or what else could you do in a POW camp? Oh, get sick. Yeah, a lot of them died without treatment. Yeah, it's not uncommon. This is predominantly Scotch-Irish. They just died. They wasted away in a POW camp. Um, while big time generals and people who went through the academy, the military academy at West Point, who all knew each other and their families had been in the same circles for generations. Yeah, they they got a pass. They they got to maintain their plantation homes and their properties. And um, yeah, yep. Yeah. And the little man, the southerner, and, and the freed slaves, the freed slaves got, got screwed too. The, there was no freedom to be had as a result of the Civil War for poor whites or freed freed men, freed men and women and children. There was no win. Um, freed people were promised by the federal government to receive, I believe it was like 100 acres or 10 acres of free land as reparation. And you want to talk about a reparation. That, that was a very appropriate reparation at that time, especially in the South, considering they had vast tracts of land that were completely unoccupied. Um, that didn't happen. That that was a promise politicians made well over a century ago, and they're still making it to this day. It still hasn't materialized. What does that tell you about the promises they've been making? Empty. Uh, 
Anyway, I guess I've rambled on about the South quite a bit. Um, no, the, the elected officials from the North were as racist, if not more racist. They benefited directly from um, unconstitutional arrests and captures immensely. They, the Underground Railroad, not a safe haven. Sex trafficking institution. Yeah, the people that they harbored, they trafficked them, just like people are getting traffic coming over the border um, illegally into Texas. Oh, oh, that is something I wanted to talk about. I want to talk about the, apparently a USS or a destroyer and a Chinese warship came in with yards of each other. That is bullshit. That is bullshit. Why? Why did the, why did the admiral, why did the captain of that ship allow his personnel his enlisted force personnel to come in with that kind of proximity of an adversarial entity. That is disgusting. That is a war crime. I want to know who this motherfucker was who allowed that to happen. That is disgusting. They better hope this is just some asinine fucking script, some asinine fucking um, uh, false flag to be like, okay, so Ukraine's not quite panning out, but maybe, you know... We got this little bonfire going for China, so maybe we can just stoke the fires a little bit, USS Cole style. No, that's disgusting. That is, at, a false flag does not mean they don't actually put people in harm's way. No, false flags uh, quite often cause catastrophic um, loss of life. Oh yeah, a false flag does not mean that the civilians are aware that it's a false flag. Um, false flag means shit. The enlisted force personnel might not even be aware. That's how they like to keep it. Um, so I hope it's I hope it's just a false flag on their part or a script. Because if it's not, that captain should be behind bars by the end of the day. That is disgusting. That is so disgusting that. They that that captain would let that happen. I, I I can't even begin to imagine how many enlisted personnel, how many enlisted force bodies who don't have a pot to piss in, whose families back home don't have a pot to piss in if they end up dead because of some stunt like that. Disgusting, absolutely disgusting. So US Navy destroyer, Chinese warship. Sickening. Sickening. Um, Chinese warship passed in unsafe manner. Bullshit. Bullshit. That's the same fucking stunt they pulled with the MQ-9 Reaper. Oh, the Russian pilots um, approached us in an unsafe manner. That means nothing. That means nothing to the art of war. They're not there to um, evaluate the Chinese and the Russians on their safety protocols, motherfuckers. That warship did not approach in an unsafe manner. That captain needs to be held accountable. So this is by Reuters, updated an hour ago. No name on it, let's scroll to the bottom. I wanna see this person's name. Um, reporting by Ted Hessen in Washington, editing by Grant McCool. Fuck out of here. Fuck out of here. June 4th, 2023, 11.43 a.m. Washington, June 4th, a Chinese warship came within 150 yards. That is less than two football fields away. Are you fucking kidding me? They could have taken out everybody on that ship because of that fucking captain. <clears throat> a Chinese warship came within 150 yards of a U.S. destroyer on the Taiwan Strait in an unsafe manner, U.S. military officials have said. Bullshit. If you're a U.S. military official, that is not an unsafe manner. This is not a safety investigation, dumbass. You do safety investigations within the military, within the U.S. military, within the department. You are not performing safety investigations for the Chinese and the fucking Russians when they, when they, according to you guys, 
act in an adversarial manner. This is bullshit. I'm not paying them for a fucking safety investigation of the enemy. I'm paying them to defend us from the enemy. I'm paying them not to use enlisted force bodies like fucking political pawns so they can stoke the fires of their ne next bonfire. Yeah, I don't care about your fucking vanities, motherfucker. How about that? Um, as China blamed the United States for deliv deliberately provoking risk. I believe it at this point. These people are so fucking desperate for a false flag. They're, they don't even, they don't even try. They don't even try to hide it anymore. They just spin the wheel of fortune. Hey, somebody spin the wheel and see where we're going to false flag today. No, this is some false flag bullshit. And you know what? As much as I despise the CCP, I'm going to believe the CCP on this one. U.S. and Canadian navies on Saturday were conducting a joint exercise in the strait which separates the island of Taiwan and China when the Chinese ship cut in front of the U.S. guided missile destroyer Chung Hoon, forcing it to slow down to avoid a collision. The U.S. Indo-Pacific Command said, bullshit, bullshit. No, you guys are not going to put this on the CCP. Bullshit. You have the, the innovative advanced weaponry and tools to see this shit coming literally from miles away. You have the communication systems. You have the internal checklists. Bull shit. This is a war crime. The People's Republic of China has claimed self-ruled Taiwan as its territory since the defeated Republic of China government fled to the island in 1949 after losing a civil war to Mao Zedong's communists. Taiwan's government says the PRC, the People's Republic of China, has never ruled the island and U.S. President Joe Biden has said the U.S. would defend Taiwan in the... Taiwan in the f event of a Chinese invasion. Chinese military rebuked the United States and Canada for deliberately provoking risk. And that's exactly what it sounds like. Look, they're not my MVP either. But I'm not going to stand for a government, especially one that I served and defended for 23 fucking years, deliberately pro provoking risk and putting the lives of young American kids in the balance. Fuck you. That's disgusting. Whoever the captain of this ship was should have disobeyed a direct order. That direct order was to do nothing. That's an unlawful order. That captain put his entire fleet at risk. And more, more. He put the, he put the world at risk. We do not need to antagonize anybody right now. You know what? We need those destroyers back by America because we don't have a fucking border anywhere. We don't have um, uh, a coastal oceanic border. We don't have a, a, a border on terrain, on land. We don't have borders. What the fuck are they doing in Taiwan? False flag. This is a false flag, people. This is a false fucking flag. And the fact that they had predominant listed force bodies on that, on that ship, fuck them. Whoever the, cap the captain of the ship is who did not disobey an unlawful order to not engage. No. No. That's in violation of international law. That's in violation of Geneva Convention. That's in violation of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. This motherfucker, if anybody needs to be in detention before trial, it's a motherfucker who chooses his career who chooses his career over the enlisted force peons who make his fucking career possible. Fuck you, buddy. Fuck you. You're going to prison. I'm done with this shit. Mm -mm. The U.S. Indo-Pacific Command said the Chung Hoon and Canada's Montreal were conducting a routine transit of the strait when the Chinese ship cut in front of the American vessel. The Chinese ship's closest point of approach was 150 yards and its actions violated the maritime rules of the road of safe passage in international waters, the U.S. command said. Let's invert this. Here's probably what happened. This is my best guess. Operator error. The Chinese, they're probably reporting this as, holy shit, the, on the Chinese side, I don't know, I don't read their outlets, maybe I should, um, they're probably saying, 
the opposite. Um, the U.S. did something very unsafe towards us, and this is what happened, and we're not happy. So then the U.S., the DOD, spineless DOD personnel who allowed this to happen are going to be like, no, 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 we didn't do it. They, they started it. No, 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 no. You should be over by America right now. That's, that's how I know you're automatically in the wrong. You guys are still protecting Taiwan. Taiwan is not your country. Yeah. The Strait of Taiwan is, is not predisposing um, hundreds of millions of Americans to guerrilla warfare right now and fentanyl and sexually exploitative ideologies and practices and sex trafficking. Yeah. Why is the U.S. Navy in Taiwan in that area when they, you know, could it just be rallying and circling the wagons, Conestoga style, keeping us safe? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, this is a this is a bullshit biscuit. So I'm gonna do some research and see if I can't find some um some sources to flesh out what um Ted Hessen in Washington and Grant McCool. So I'm gonna guess McCool might not even be somebody's actual name. It might just be like, you know, um invisible ink kind of shit that happens. Um, but I'm, I'm still going to look these people up in Paycheck DNA Check. My best guess, and this is just a guess off the cuff, I'm gonna, I feel comfortable hypothesizing that these people are PSYOP plants, at the least, at the very, very least. Especially Grant McCool, who's, that's not his real name. Grant McCool's not his real name. Um, anyway, yeah, I'm gonna look this up. This is bullshit. Even if it did happen, even if, if, if it's not a script, it's a war crime. Uh, let me see how many people are on that ship. They might not even give the name of the ship. A Chinese warship, uh, US destroyer in Taiwan. <laughs> Sorry, I've got to... Nope. You would think that would be an important detail to give. As a journalist, how many how many souls on board that destroyer? Why wouldn't these journalists point? That's that is an intuitive no brainer family feud. If you say it, you're automatically at the top. It's like the number one ding 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 fifty five percent. Yeah, they don't even mention the number of bodies of enlisted force, um, junior ranking enlisted force, at that on this destroyer and that is very, very disturbing to me. That would be something Americans would need to, to, need to know about. That's disgusting. That is absolutely disgusting. Um, this is on Reuters. They call this journalism. This is not journalism. This is overtly misleading. Oh my God, the false flag on this is like stinking so bad. Nah, nah, these motherfuckers are not going to embroil us in another war. Our elected officials, you motherfuckers in Congress, get a fucking backbone. Tell those motherfuckers to start protecting our borders. Why is Southcom not protecting our borders? Why is Northcom not protecting our borders? We have naval assets in both. Why are they not protecting our borders? Disgusting. Disgusting. And here's where it's no mistake that the highest concentration of the smallest sliver of, of military members, the senior ranking military officials and in intelligentsia, here's where they sit in the Pentagon, heavily guarded. Yeah. Yeah, it's been attacked 9-11, and that was unfortunate, and I've mentioned that before on this episode, so don't twist it, but they sit in the Pentagon. Hayes County kids don't get that. Chip Roy's constituents don't get to sit in the Pentagon behind a high wall, focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion. They sit in the Pentagon. Think about that. Have you ever been to the Pentagon? I've been to the Pentagon a few times. 
is a bitch to get into. Yeah. It's a fucking clusterfuck. It's a process. And then even when you get inside, it's still heavily guarded. And it's even heavily guarded from above with Overwatch. They sit in the Pentagon. Um, they don't have a leg to stand on. This is, this is where our diplomat, warrior, aristocracy, and military intelligentsia like to hang out and benefit from war. The Pentagon. It's no mistake that their actual newspaper, a lot of people don't know this watching from home, but the Pentagon has an actual newspaper that it circulates. And you want to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, hi, Pat Ryder. Can you please explain why the Pentagon's official paper is called the Pentagram? Do you think that's appropriate for diversity, equity, and inclusion? That's not a joke, people. They actually call it the Pentagram. Is that, is that appropriate, Pat Ryder? Are you cool with that? I'm just asking, asking for a friend. Anyway, anyway, um, I gotta get going. I got some stuff that I wanna get done today. Um, kinda wanna chill out a little bit. I've, I've been going through all the notifications on my phone, but um, for people not watching this from home, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I, yeah, hope the weather's great, and just relaxing, uneventful. Bye.